Hello, I'm your host, Effie Pilarino, and today I'm delighted to have with us Dr. Ingrid Vasiliu Feltes. Dr. Ingrid, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Thank you for inviting me, and it's a pleasure, as always, to be with you. Yeah, for, for my audience, I mean, I don't know where to start. You know, Dr. Ingrid is a distinguished thought leader. I like to think of her as the perfect fusion of academic solidity, entrepreneurship, passion for deep tech, for financial inclusion. She holds many hats. I met her through her role in the European Union Blockchain Observatory Forum, the World Business Angel Investment Forum, but she leads many positions. And feel free, Dr. Ingrid, to add, you know, so many diverse but yet connected. Everything's interconnected increasingly in our world. And today, I want to spend time and focus on the importance of tech sovereignty. You have been very vocal and, and you've developed a framework to think about tech sovereignty. And I'd like to start from there. You have been talking about the data power trifecta framework, which is really addressing the tech sovereignty issue, which is, I guess, really hot, both because of the advancements in AI, all the economic developments and the geopolitical tensions. So it's quite a complex issue. So can you tell us about this framework? Sure. Well, it, it was inspired by all the news that we're getting every day and all the reports that we're reading about how tech giants and data that we're generating at a global level is exponentially increasing on a daily basis. And that when you look at the GDP generated by the tech giants currently globally, they would actually, all of them, be in the top 10 most powerful countries in the world if you made the tech GDP as an equivalent from a country perspective. So it has caused me to pause and reflect that unfortunately or fortunately, data has now much more power than it ever had. It was always important. Since the Middle Ages, everybody wanted data and information and, and it led to sovereignty in a traditional sense. But now I felt that it was important for us to realize that data has novel connotations and data power has novel connotations. With the deep tech advancements that we see, data now is having multiple facets. We have multiple digital identities also, not only as individuals, but also as corporations. So data power in the traditional sense has changed completely in terms of the strategic intelligence it can generate. Additionally, initially it was a wordplay <laughs> that I thought about the power in generating data, but it also then triggered me to, to look up all the reports published by the amount of energy consumption we're having that has also increased exponentially. And when I started to look at some statistics of, of what it means in equivalent layman terms to understand the magnitude of power that needs to be generated to, to fuel all this innovation and this digital transformation that we're seeing, I realized that, yes, data from a power generation is also an important component. So that's the second part of the framework. And then the third one you alluded to already, I kept reading more and more how many countries that before didn't have an important seat at the diplomatic table and countries that before maybe were neglected in, in vital sovereignty conversations because of their access and their natural resources in raw minerals or renewable energy sources have now new geopolitical power that they never had before and are being key stakeholders in certain situations when geopolitical reconfigurations are being discussed. So that's why I called it the trifecta, because it can, if we think about the positive impact, this trifecta can lead humanity to achieve some of the United Nations 2030 and 2050 goals. But we have to be cautious because if we don't use this data power responsibly, it can also lead to catastrophic global security failures. So 
that was the inspiration to calling it a trifecta and a data power trifecta. Yeah, I mean, this is, you're bringing up a topic about now it seems to me that countries are faced with the challenge of how to balance these different powers that you, you talked about, the, the energy demands for digital transformation and, you know, to develop the digital infrastructure and the rest of the challenges around climate, around inclusion. How, how, how can we start thinking with the help of your framework or rather the countries, how can they start thinking about this? Absolutely. And it's a question I always get, well, what should we do? Stop innovation and transformation? And my answer is always actually quite maybe biologically oriented. I'm a physician by training, so I give an analogy always. People ask, do you need your heart or the lungs? And I always answer, you need both to survive. You cannot make that choice. And I think the same analogy should be for us. We cannot stifle innovation. We cannot stifle transformation. We need to move forward as a society. But we need better, more suitable mechanisms to mitigate this novel data power. The same way when we had electricity the first time, we didn't give up on electricity. It can even now kill someone instantly if, if used irresponsibly. We just need to adapt our governance style. We need to adapt our business models. We need to adapt our risk assessments. We need to adapt our cyber ethics architecture. And this is something, as you know, I'm very passionate about. And I do believe that cyber ethics can bring people together. Everybody in the world, all these power players in the world need to understand that if we don't protect data, regardless who holds it, we all go, unfortunately, under. So it's essential for someone to understand that the general collaborative approach towards a cyber ethics architecture, for instance, quantum enablement, can be something that brings everybody together to move forward and still innovate, still proceed with all our digital transformation, but work towards architectures that are protecting us to not lose this sovereignty and to appropriately maybe decentralize sovereignty as opposed to have monopolies like we've been seeing over the last few years. So so you, it seems that you are foreseeing or calling for a need while we are competing, right, to change the way we are competing and have it in a more collaborative way. And the collaboration is focused in the areas where it's a win-win for everybody. And, and I guess we haven't been doing that at all because we have been striving for monopolies, absolute dominance, competition, and, you know, at the expense of, you know, the overall socioeconomic world that we live in that is invisible but yet very real, right? Absolutely, absolutely. The global GDP affects everyone. It's a zero sum game at one point. So it's it's important. And then definitely, I once heard a speaker use the term co-optition. <laughs> so it's glo global collaboration, but also global competition. You have to find an intersection where everybody realizes that if, if we all hurt each other, everybody will suffer negative consequences. We need to find something that everybody can agree on. And my personal view is that that something can be cybersecurity or ethics, because no matter what data type we talk about, no matter what type of uh, resources that we all need, we talk about if it's raw minerals or renewable energy sources that are driving the current transformation at a global level, we all need to still keep our national security and we all hopefully have global security. I, I want, if we have time a little bit to touch on the nuclear energy, because that's a great example where if we don't all col collaborate and cooperate, if we have a major catastrophic accident okay. with nuclear energy, all these other elements that drive competition now will be futile, obviously. So. It's it's amazing how you have painted this picture of 
of all the factors that are pulling us apart to compete and create extreme tensions, right? And yet we have two new aspects that are bringing us together, which you you highlighted. One is cybersecurity and the other is ethics. And unless we set out an intention to intentionally design whatever we are designing within our national borders, within our strategic objectives, if we don't do it in a way that takes into account the global cybersecurity implications and the global ethical implications, you know, we, we are shooting ourselves in, in the foot. That is what you're saying. You also talk in, in your latest article that really was, was brilliant. You talked about, you alluded to these novel cybersecurity, um, cyber ethic protocols rather, that have certain characteristics. Can you tell us a little bit how you envision these what are the, the aspects there? I think they're adaptive, right? Absolutely. So I, yes, in, in one of the latest articles, I shared that we cannot use old fashioned cyber ethics approaches to deal with all these novel technologies that we're witnessing currently. I mean, it, it's not feasible. Not that we're discarding the old stuff. It was great for that era, but now, we're witnessing a rapid exponential adoption of deep tech almost on a weekly basis. We see novel advancements. So old fashioned governance style does not work anymore. Old fashioned business models don't work anymore. And similarly, cyber ethics, whatever models we had, they were fantastic before, but now they need to be adapted. And I alluded to the fact that we need to learn from nature, from architecture, from anthropology, and from other systems that are adaptable, that learn to quickly, quickly recalibrate and reshape and reconfigure what needs to happen when a novel threat emerges. So similarly, we need to do all of that for our technological safeguards and for our ethics frameworks. The traditional ethics frameworks are not feasible anymore, not the principles. The ethics principles are always the same, but the way we deploy them the way we embed them into the enterprise architecture, whatever it is, if it's government enterprise architecture or private industry, I... it doesn't matter. Everybody's vulnerable. So my point was, if we embed these novel decentralized cyber ethics approaches into the fabric of whatever enterprise we have, if it's government, like GovTech is very important for global security, or private industry enterprise. But what I'm trying to convey is that it does not work to try to keep doing what we're doing on the technological innovation and transformation to have an ultra rapid pace and then hope that a 180 page cyber ethics PDF framework will work. That's not feasible. So a decentralized approach, and I bring up blockchain because as you know, I was a very big proponent of blockchain since 2016. And I do believe, although we're not talking that much about it, it can actually be the foundational digital trust that we need for all these AI deployments and all the digital twin deployments and 6G and multi-cloud computing. So I feel, although we don't talk that much about it, blockchain offers unique features the same way quantum enablement and quantum security offers solutions that we can use. And while you don't see that many people talk about some more niche deep tech, it doesn't attract as much attention in social media, but there are powerful tools available now that companies just need to learn how to harness and how to leverage. Examples are data mesh, data fabric, federated learning, confidential computing. We have a lot of tools available if they're just deployed for the right reasons and for cyber ethics. They can actually offer some of those safeguards that we want. We just need to all come together and dedicate ourselves the same way we do for all other customization that we do to just apply them to what is responsible and what can preserve some of the digital trust that we've been seeing eroding bit by bit. And I feel it's a critical global emergency to restore that digital trust because the, the society, when you talk with laymen that are not in deep tech, they do not trust technology anymore. 
So it's going to be a challenge. They need to live in a digital society and don't trust technology. That's going to be a dichotomy that will cause challenges. Yes. So. yes. And in this phase, we don't have the time for you know to adapt and and wait for for late followers everything's happening so fast and and it's creating larger and more deeper digital gaps tensions exactly. that have so, social and economic not financial only social and, and economic ramifications that are unmanageable on a, on a local level, it needs that coordination. And I'm totally with you on this. It, this is the time where convergence in practice can really work wonders. Convergence of the different technologies that we have, building tech stacks that can customize the and adapt in what is needed versus, you know, very rigid and, and non-adaptive tech stacks that we've been working with and, and that have worked for a long time. And now there's no way these things can work. What works today Absolutely. won't work in, 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 in a year, let's say. Totally. In another article, I used a metaphor, tectonic shifts, because we're having seismic forces changing the ecosystem. So the same way you have earthquakes and tsunamis, right, that are causing a reconfiguration. I think we're seeing the same thing now, a reconfiguration in global economy, in geopolitical forces, in who drives innovation and who is still, you know, responsibly deploying these technologies versus who decided to sacrifice cyber ethics and just push forward with all risk ahead. And we've seen the fines in social media that companies are prepared to pay for violating privacy. So, Dr. Ingrid, I'd like to close our conversation with this metaphor, powerful metaphor of the tectonic shifts that, that we are living in. And we need to have that flexibility, openness, and, and you know the intention to create something that is really fit for purpose in these conditions. Thank you so Absolutely. much for being with us. Thank you for inviting me.